Great, we are ready to begin, Ambassador Schmier. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Schmier, the President and Chairman of the Board of the Middle East Policy Council. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the program today, our 106th Capitol Hill Conference. In light of October being designated as Cybersecurity Month, we have chosen for, today to, for today's discussion the topic Middle East Cybersecurity, Threats and Opportunities. As we have seen with cyber attacks on systems and infrastructure, with ransomware demands, and with other cyber-based challenges, this is an area of increasing concern involving the national security and economic well-being of states in the region. Today's Capitol Hill Conference is our seventh to be held virtually since the start of the pandemic in the spring of 2020. This format gives us the opportunity to include panelists and audience members from throughout the US and around the world. So welcome to all of you who are joining us from both near and far. Before I turn to today's program, I would like to say a few words about the Middle East Policy Council. The council was established in 1981 for the purpose of promoting dialogue and education concerning the US and the countries of the Middle East. We are pleased to be marking our 40th anniversary this year. Among our core programs are our quarterly Capitol Hill conferences, such as today's event, our quarterly journal, Middle East Policy, which can be found in more than 16,000 libraries worldwide, and our educational outreach program, Teach Mideast, which provides educational resources on the Middle East geared for secondary school students and teachers. Please visit us on the web at www.mepc.org and our Teach Mideast program at www.teachmideast.org to learn more about our organization and activities. Concerning today's event, the conference proceedings will be posted in video and transcript form on our website, as will a recap of the discussion. An, edit, an edited transcript of the program will be published in the next issue of our journal, Middle East Policy. Now let me turn to today's distinguished panelists. Our first speaker will be James Shires, an assistant professor at the University of Leiden's Institute for Security and Global Affairs. James is participating from Leiden in the Netherlands. Our second speaker will be Simon Handler, a fellow in the Atlantic Council's Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Simon is joining us from Washington, DC. Our third panelist is the Honorable Jim Moran, a senior policy advisor at Nelson Mullins. Jim is a former member of Congress, representing Virginia's 8th District, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Middle East Policy Council. He joins us today from McLean, Virginia. And our fourth panelist will be Gaudat Bhagat, a professor at the National Defense University's Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. The moderator of today's discussion is Basima al Hussein, the executive director of the Middle East Policy Council. Basim and, and I are both participating today from Washington, DC. During the program, I would ask all attendees to be sure to mute their microphones. Please submit your questions to the panelists during the program through the email address info at mepc.org. That is info at mepc.org. With that, I'm pleased to turn the floor over uh, to Mr. Shire, to uh, James Shires to begin today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Schmer. It's fantastic to be here, and I'm really pleased to contribute to this important discussion uh, held, hosted by the Middle East Policy Council. Uh, thanks to them for organizing, and thanks to my fellow panelists for contributing their insights. I'm lucky enough to be able to start the discussion. So what I'm going to do is set the scene uh, on cybersecurity issues in the Middle East region, trying to give an overview of 
the different kinds of threats and risks that um, an increasingly ubiquitous online space brings to the region, um, and maybe how we can uh, counter them, uh, some of those threats as well. So I won't take too long, and then I can pass over to my fellow panelists. And of course, uh, we mainly want to get to a very rich discussion in the second half of this session. So first of all, cybersecurity in the Middle East is a very broad topic. Right? It denotes uh, anything to do with threats to digital networks, to um, online issues. And to start with, we can begin by dividing the kinds of cybersecurity issues in the Middle East into two. One focuses on the security of information. So what we see on social networks, on um, social media, and the kind of things like that, those are security of information issues. How to corral, how to ensure that an information space is productive, is free, open, but also uh, not dangerous, not contributing to other national security issues in the region. The second kind of issue is one about the security of networks. So preventing uh, the hacking or intrusion into networks in the region. Now, the more that digital networks are connected to uh, societal functions more generally, this becomes an increasing risk. And I'm going to focus most of my remarks on this latter question about the security of networks. And we can see five really important um, reasons why we should think about the security of digital networks in the Middle East. First, the growth of the economies in the Middle East is highly connected to the digital economy, to their digitalization, to the extent to which they can move online, they can, people can conduct businesses online, especially in a post-pandemic world. Now, the growth of a digital economy brings the growth of risk to that economy. So the um, production of businesses, the profit of businesses, the growth of the economy overall is connected to their ability to transact online safely and securely. There are many kinds of cyber risks to these transactions, to these businesses that are increasing, especially in develop developing economies as in the Middle East. Um, Richard mentioned ransomware as being a really obvious one, but there are others as well, issues of fraud, of identity theft, of cybercrime, and so on. So these kind of economic reasons, economic concerns for uh, cybersecurity are fundamental to the Middle East. But they're not the only ones, and I'll highlight a few others. The second is issues of social disruption. So going beyond the purely economic reasons for thinking, caring about cybersecurity, we have to also think about the possibility for the disruption to critical infrastructure. This isn't just state-based, so most states have good policies and practices to protect critical infrastructure, especially in some of the Gulf states, um, but it's also regional critical infrastructure. So undersea cables, maritime and aviation communications, uh, things that connect countries in the Middle East through internet networks and internet communications. These kinds of critical communications infrastructures are also at risk on top of the national ones, energy networks, health networks, those kind of things. So there's a real risk to critical infrastructure and the possibility for disruption to that infrastructure through cyber means. The third uh, element I want to highlight is the question of privacy and rights. So we have an economic reason to care about cybersecurity. We have a social disruption reason to care about cybersecurity. The third one is individual. And here we have a real um, highly contested space in terms of what it means to be private online. This is not a unique debate to the Middle East region. It's going on in all corners of the world, but is especially live when you have some states clearly infringing uh, individual rights and privacy online and others taking more steps to protect those rights. The way in which individuals and citizens can negotiate their online privacy rights, especially in situations of conflict or um, a lot of act, government access to data is really crucial and is fundamental um, for individual security. And so this conversation is all about cybersecurity from a human security point of view, protecting the individual, protecting individual rights online. The last one I want to highlight 
uh, in terms of the kinds of cybersecurity issues we're concerned with gets us more to interstate relations. Um, cyber capabilities have been developed by some states in the region and are used by those states to um, target uh, networks and organizations in other states in the region. This brings cyber capabilities into the purview of military capabilities or forms of foreign policy or national power that can be used against other states in the region. This kind of interstate threat in cybersecurity is growing. Um, and many states are investing in cyber capabilities from a military and defense point of view. From this perspective, cybersecurity becomes an issue not just of economic concern, not of social disruption or individual privacy, but one of escalation and conflict. We already see many unfortunate cases in the region where states are fragile or have dissolved into conflict that are either civil wars or internationalized civil wars. And in these kinds of cases where there is a high risk of conflict, the potential use of cyber capabilities that are not that easy to control um, that could lead to escalation is something that requires real attention. It requires understanding of the potentially of these capabilities, but also dialogue between states to try and roll back from the inclusion of these cyber capabilities into existing conflicts. And so that's just a flavor of the kind of different risks that the Middle East region is facing in cybersecurity. And I just want to highlight a few uh, cross-cutting issues um, that have been in the news that have been highlighted uh, by many different actors that touch on all of these different areas. Um, and these are more uh, really live policy concerns that I think both a US audience and a Middle East audience will be um, really aware of and need to be grappled with significantly in the near future. So three of these issues. The first one is data localization. So states and companies requiring the holding of data to be not um, sent between continents or between countries, but to be held within those states, whether this is social media data or data um, collected by say health providers or any other consumer um, facing organization. The localization of data poses economic issues. It introduces friction into markets, but also in, uh, it gives states more control over the data. And that's why it's the main rationale. Here. When we have uh, apps and uh, many uh, forms of data collection in a post-pandemic world, what to do with this data, who has access to this data is a really important question. This is as much a corporate question as a state. Um, it is corporations that are building uh, cloud data centers, putting them in different locations, such as in Bahrain or Saudi Arabia, and using those to uh, work for the region as a whole. The second policy point I want to make is um, this policy debates around spyware, around hacking software that can be used in uh, access devices um, without the uh, user's permission. Now, this is something that is on the news significantly. It's both a national security problem and a human rights problem. And it poses a really important threat from uh, an export control point of view. Uh, how should states work with each other to sell the spyware, to use this spyware responsibly and prevent its misuse and abuse? It's not an easy question. It's one that doesn't have clear answers, but there are various policy avenues to try and bring that together, both internationally through norms and regulation and domestically. And then the final one is this question on conflict and escalation. While states at an international level have, uh, through the UN and various processes at the UN, they have agreed uh, norms of responsible state behavior to try and prevent targeting of critical infrastructure, to try and prevent uh, escalation in cyberspace. These norms have not necessarily filtered down to a regional or national level, and especially not in the Middle East. So there's a real policy priority there to try and think about how these broad norms agreed internationally can be applied at a regional level in the Middle East region. I'll stop there. 
those are just opening remarks. Very happy to get into any of these issues in the Q&A. Thanks once again uh, for being here. And I'll hand over to our second panelist, Simon Handy. Thank you, James, for that excellent rundown on the state of cybersecurity in the region. Uh, thanks also to Richard Basima and Middle East Policy Council for hosting this excellent discussion and including me. So as James mentioned, cyber threats are such a serious issue across the Middle East because frankly, they plague every country in the region. And threat actors come in different forms, ranging from non-state actors, uh, including terrorist organizations to states, and several of which are outside the region as well. And the challenges uh, presented by this array of adversaries uh, from dis destructive attacks on critical infrastructure, uh, as have been well documented, to cyber espionage operations, sometimes hack and leak or other forms of information operations. Um, and the means and vectors that adversaries are using to conduct their operations also vary widely, uh, from phishing to supply chain attacks to ransomware and other forms of cyber crime and beyond. So I think it's unrealistic to think that there's any one solution uh, that will solve this set of challenges. Uh, and if anything, uh, the threat will only increase as the region continues its digital transformation and further integrates technology and automation uh, in sectors throughout the economy, as James was talking about. Uh, so adversaries are eventually going to have their way uh, uh, and, and, and pretty often. So it's important not to have an all or nothing uh, approach to security. So I think we need to be reframing our concept of what success looks like here. Uh, instead of looking for a silver bullet uh, the United States and its allies and partners in the Middle East should focus on uh, more effectively competing and incrementally uh, improving over time. With such a variegated, ever-evolving threat environment, uh, it's all the more important to have a strategy that's really nimble and aligns with the realities of cyberspace and can inform uh, policy decisions accordingly. So while policymakers have certainly made progress uh, in cyber strategy uh, since uh, the days of the, the Cold War analogies to cyber conflict, uh, there's still this legacy uh, that frames cyber conflict as one featuring these infrequent and really catastrophic attacks. But this really, of course, is not the case. And cyber conflict uh, is much more of a persistent low grade type of engagement. So I think policymakers would uh, benefit from finding a better frame for cyber strategy. And my colleagues at the Atlantic Council and I have been working through what an improved cyber strategy would look like. And we found that there are several overarching lessons actually from counterterrorism strategy that we can apply to cyber strategy uh, to help compete more effectively. So fundamentally, both in counterterrorism and in cyber conflict, you've got this sea of unaligned actors and, and vulnerabilities everywhere, uh, constant contact with adversaries and, and this contest uh, continually for information. So practically, this approach to cybersecurity highlights the importance of things like prioritizing risk and winning an intelligence competition and, and focusing on uh, detection uh, of breaches uh, over reaction and retaliating, uh, as well as promoting cooperation with uh, partners uh, in the region and the private sector. So these all uh, represent approaches to counterterrorism as well, which uh, of course is an area uh, in which the United States and its allies and partners in the region have significant experience and have demonstrated cooperation. Uh, so the first point on winning the intelligence contest is critical in cybersecurity, which features adversaries competing to collect information and then use it to exploit one another to strengthen their respective positions um, strategically and operationally. 
And like in counterterrorism, where gathering information on terrorists requires local sources with intimate knowledge of areas and populations, cyber conflict consists of studying networks and weeding out adversaries that are intent on operating uh, without detection for long periods of time. And cooperation is of critical importance to this. And effective cyber strategy uh, overall, um, really. Uh, so the Abraham Accords actually offer uh, an opportunity for allies and partners in the region to uh, cooperate on sharing capabilities as well as intelligence here. Um, there has been an increase in bilateral uh, cyber defense agreements, uh, which is a positive sign. For example, um, I think it was in July, Israel and Morocco signed a cybersecurity accord that will facilitate operational collaboration and, um, and information sharing and, and R&D uh, between the two countries. Um, but to be more competitive in the long run and uh, in the spirit of promoting deeper ties here, um, Israel and Arab states could focus more on multilateral co uh, cooperation. And not too long ago, uh, this might have sounded like a far-fetched idea to some people, um, but there is growing appetite uh, in the region for multilateral cooperation on cyber. Uh, so the Atlantic Council actually just hosted uh, the N7 summit in the UAE last week, which uh, uh, convened high-level officials from Israel and six Arab countries, uh, which with which it's uh, normalized relations. And I actually spoke with someone who attended, who told me that cyber was raised by several senior government officials who are uh, definitely interested in exploring ways to multilaterally cooperate on cyber defense. So cyber cooperation, uh, as well as science and technology was one of the major drivers of the Abraham Accords. And we've seen the, the type of significant impact it can have on society as a whole. Uh, so broader and deeper cooperation here against common adversaries has the power to bring these states even closer together, uh, even in areas outside of cybersecurity. Um, this type of cooperation is critical uh, to sharing up-to-date intelligence on the latest threats and evolutions in, in how adversaries are operating and their capabilities and interests uh, in order for defenders to prioritize security and risk based on value to the adversaries. And what I mean by that is that there are innumerable vulnerabilities in cyberspace and uh, defenders can't realistically expect to be everywhere at once. So uh, it's important to be able to marshal resources in accordance uh, with areas of highest consequence based on that intelligence and what uh, adversaries are seeking. So it's impossible, for instance, to defend against every knife-wielding terrorist who's intent on harming folks um, in public. But uh, what we do is set up metal detectors where there's concentrated risk and outsized potential consequences. So adversaries in, in cyber uh, are like terrorists in that they're nimble, able to evolve their tactics and exploit different gaps. Um, but by cooperating with each other in the private sector, states can work to evolve and shift the landscape in front of adversaries. Um, in the U.S., uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, has led the way in engaging with the private sector, forming partnerships to share critical threat information. Um, and it's clear that multilateral cooperation must include the private sector uh, in order to have uh, that necessary impact on, on security outcomes. And, and the last thing I'll add is just like in counterterrorism, the United States, um, its allies and partners in the, in the Middle East have an opportunity here to set an example for the rest of the world based on their approach and behavior in cyberspace. So cyber conflict is, is more evident to the public in the Middle East than perhaps any other region uh, on Earth. Um, by serving and protecting their populations, 
the Middle East can play a big leadership role in developing norms of responsible cyber statecraft, which I, in my opinion, the international community has been sorely lacking. So uh, that's, that's what I have for you today. Um, looking forward to a great discussion and I'll pass it to Congressman Jim Moran next for his remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Can you hear me? Just nod. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simon and James. Uh, I certainly uh, can't disagree with anything either of you uh, said, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel. I, I hope that the uh, the Middle East Policy Council doesn't regret that. But uh, as professionals, as I would expect, uh, you were relatively general, accurate, but general. You didn't, in the sense that you didn't name any names. You talked about um, uh, uh, trends and, uh, and conditions, uh, but um, I think it's important to name names. And I, I'm glad that, that you began this in, in such a professional way, but I will name names. There, uh, there are three things that particularly trouble me when we talk about uh, uh, the cyber uh, security, uh, uh, cyber threats, uh, cyber opportunities, um, and I'm going to list the three of them and then talk about them to the extent that I, I have the time to do that. Uh, the first one is Iran. Uh, the second is our relationship with alleged allies. And then the third is um, uh, the uh, cyber hacking that has uh, actually infected our, our own US political system. So with regard to Iran, uh, that's the most serious. It's the most serious on the planet. Um, since 2009, there have been, at least I've counted over 90 major incidents uh, of cyber conflict. There is basically a cyber war going on between Iran, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States. The United States, for the most part, hasn't wanted to get offensive, but it has, uh, it has been kind of sucked into it, uh, certainly uh, in support of, uh, uh, of Israel. And understandably, Israel is, uh, feels threatened by the development of uh, uh, nuclear capability on Iran's part. Um, and they're gonna do everything they can to destroy that capability. And uh, Stuxnet was the most obvious uh, that was well reported by David Sanger in the uh, New York Times and has subsequently been substantiated uh, in, uh, in the in public documents. Um, but those are serious attacks uh, and the consequences are, are very serious. Iran, of course, for, from its point of view, uh, knows that Israel has a nuclear capability and feels that it needs to uh, defend itself. And I, I do believe some people in the, the government hierarchy of Iran want to use it for constructive economic purposes, but clearly uh, the uh, Republican Guard, the military in Iran uh, uh, is looking to having uh, offensive capability of nuclear weaponry. So that's a very serious conflict. And one of the reasons why it is so serious is not just the vulnerability of uh, our energy supply, less so because of the development of uh, uh, of, of fracking in the United States, but um, uh, the, the Arab Gulf states provide a substantial amount of energy to the rest of the world. And that supply of energy can be compromised if uh, Iran uh, is able to do so. And of course it has attacked uh, Saudi oil facilities and that had an immediate economic uh, adverse effect upon the global economy. Now. It's not the case now, and of course, uh, energy prices are a threat. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, my concern goes beyond that, though. If it escalates, and oftentimes escalation 
um, is, uh, is unplanned for, happens too fast to control, to get it under, uh, uh, to um, wrap our arms, uh, arms around it and try to contain it. And uh, that escalation, uh, if it were to happen, I do think uh, Russia and China may very well uh, come down on the side of Iran. And we could even have a world war that was precipitated by this cyber war that is currently going on. So that's the number one threat. And it may be the biggest threat to our planet uh, right now. Uh, the, the second is with regard to the use of cyber capability. The US government and European allies to the most part, but not to the same extent, has been urging the Arab states particularly to wean themselves off of uh, dependence upon fossil fuels for the growth of their economy. Uh, and, uh, and the way to do that, we've, we've told them, is through the development of information technology. Uh, the more technology, the better. The, the more uh, the cyber capacity, the better. And so uh, we have shared our technology with them under what I think is a relatively naive assumption that they're only gonna use it for peaceful purposes. And that has not necessarily been the case. In the case of many uh, Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries, that cyber capability is being used to suppress dissent. The, the, we talk about terrorists and it's easy to say, oh, well, they're using it to contain terrorists. But uh, the definition of a terrorist depends upon what country and what purposes it's that term is being used. For example, many countries will call any dissenter a terrorist. Russia does the same thing, China does the same thing, but we're talking about the Middle East. And so uh, they will tell us, well, we're using this cyber capability uh, to, uh, to fight terrorism, to counter terrorism. When the reality is they're using it to suppress human rights advocates, advocates for uh, more democratization, for the rule of law, and particularly for freedom of expression. And so the targets of much of this cyber technology have been journalists, human rights activists, any kind of protesters, and basically anyone who says anything uh, that uh, is contrary to what the regime wants them to say. And in this case, I'm particularly referring to the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, to some extent, uh, Egypt, Bahrain, we know that technology is being used to suppress dissent. And that should not be our objective. It's, all, it's well and good to want these economies to advance, to, get, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to be full partners in the 21st century, to be less reliant upon fossil fuels. But uh, I think we put aside other objectives which ought to be more important. And that is expansion of democratization of the population, uh, greater freedom of speech, more women able to be involved in the economy and society, um, the, the, um, and particularly respect for human rights. People ought to be able uh, to dissent from uh, the, uh, the dictums of their government without their being imprisoned. And, I could go down a long list with, the, with specific names of people who have been in prison simply for uh, 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 advocating some, for some of the most basic principles of uh, United States domestic and foreign policy. And so I think some of this is backfiring and I think the United States has been somewhat naive in sharing all this technology. Now, uh, specifically, there's, there was a very good um, and Richard, watch my time because there's, uh, the, the, uh, when I start getting excited about these issues, I talk too long. So just go like that when, uh, when it's time. But specifically, there was a, a very good uh, investigation conducted by Reuters that was recently published. So all this is public information. 
but uh, the Emirates uh, specifically uh, recruited deliberately about a dozen of our US intelligence officers. And uh, they used a Maryland a subcontractor uh, to teach them what they had learned from our intelligence agencies, the uh, NSA particularly. After they were taught for a few years, they then turned it on, over to their own uh, the, the Emirate-based company. But the, uh, it evolved, or I should, maybe I should say devolved, into actually monitoring, hacking the uh, iPhones, hacking the computers of Americans particularly journalists and human rights advocates and anybody that said anything contrary to uh, what they wanted said. And um, there was, this is current information. In fact, three of these American intelli former American intelligence officials were uh, just uh, convicted basically uh, for, um, uh, for sharing uh, classified information and uh, for in engaging in um, uh, 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 computer uh, fraud and abuse, uh, device fraud and uh, trafficking in arms and, and violation of the Arms Export Control Act. This is just last month. Uh, Mark Bayer, Ryan Adams, and uh, Daniel Garicki, uh, all former American intelligence officers, admitted that they conspired to furnish the Emirates with advanced technology and to assist intelligence operatives in attacking the UAE's enemies, uh, including Qatar, but also uh, people in the United States. So this is something uh, it seems to me we ought to talk about. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm glad that the Justice Department prosecuted. Uh, they wound up paying 1.6 million, uh, but, uh, there's much more to be uncovered. And the third thing, and I'll leave this to see if anybody wants to ask questions about that, it's the, it's the involvement in the American political system. And um, there has been uh, a flurry of disinformation, uh, thousands of uh, bots, these uh, robotic false names on, uh, on Twitter and uh, YouTube and so on. Uh, that have been put out there to defame people, uh, to, um, uh, to spread misinformation, to influence the election much in the way that we know Russia was trying to do in 2016 and other countries were trying to do to a lesser extent in 2020. So the, this is a serious issue. And, and I don't think that uh, when we talk about cyber in the Middle East, we can pretend that we are relatively divorced from it, that what happens in the Middle East is not going to happen to us because I think it creates a, a greater vulnerability. And of course, the, the fact that uh, in, in the case of the Gulf states, uh, it was a hacking and then, uh, and then um, uh, 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 manipulating uh, information that led to the boycott of Qatar. That was false information. Uh, but it was a matter of uh, hacking uh, the, the royal family's uh, communication devices. And that technology was provided by US intelligence officers initially. So um, this is the kind of thing that uh, it could well come back to haunt us if we're not very careful. I think that's probably the, the point I wanna leave you on. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, I want you to tell me though, uh, Richard, uh, do we have our friend Gadot uh, Bagat on our line with us? Yes, yes I'm here. He has joined. Oh, there's Gadot. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so you have a, a moment to, uh, uh, to prepare here, and I'd uh, very much like to hear what you have to say, Gadot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to uh, thank uh, Richard uh, Basima and uh, also would like to thank the Middle East Policy Council and also my dear friend Anne Joyce. Uh, she and her team made Middle East policy the major source for analysis, for information in the entire world and all over the Middle East. Thank you for all the very good work all of you are doing. Okay, uh, I will uh, touch uh, on uh, 
will divide my presentation, my talk into four uh, parts. The first one, uh, why we are talking about cyber, and then we'll focus on the two most powerful uh, cyber powers in the Middle East, Israel and Iran. And in the last part, I will say a few words on the way forward or how we can see uh, cyber playing out uh, in the coming few months, few years. Uh, first, about cyber, why uh, we are talking about this very important topic today. Uh, cyber is in everything we do now. Our meeting is online and probably we have people from all over the world. And uh, every day we bank, we uh, read newspapers, we uh, do our work online. So uh, cyber has changed our life. Uh, I mean, I am old enough to remember when I started working on my PhD and going to the library and going through all these cards in the library, not anymore. And with, with this, uh, advantages, there are also challenges, and probably I highlight a couple of challenges. Uh, cyber crime, hacking uh, is one of them, uh, stealing uh, information data, and the other one is cyber warfare. And cyber warfare is getting uh, important now because most of the conflicts uh, take place in the so-called gray zone, uh, traditional war between two professional armies uh, are less common now. Probably the exception was the recent war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, but, but most of the conflicts now take place in uh, the gray zone, uh, the gray zone somewhere between peace and war. And here, uh, cyber uh, is major area where countries can compete with each other. Main advantages of cyber, uh, it is much cheaper than traditional warfare. And uh, till today, uh, it is not easy to identify who is behind any cyber attack. Attribution still is challenge and also uh, as some of my colleagues already mentioned, so far there is no consensus. There are no regulations, rules on how to uh, prevent cyber attacks. Unlike, for example, nuclear weapons, there is non-proliferation treaty. The same thing in chemical, biological weapons. Uh, when it comes to a cyber domain, there are international efforts, but so far there is no agreement, there is no treaty to regulate the cyber domain. Uh, finally about cyber, uh, the more advanced any country is, the more vulnerable it is. Uh, in the United States, as very advanced country, uh, the great majority of Americans spend a lot of time online. When they spend time online, there is a degree of vulnerability. Uh, less developed countries, uh, they still depend on paper. Uh, they are not as vulnerable as more advanced countries. With this in mind, I will uh, say a few words on Iran and Israel. Uh, for uh, Iran, uh, first about Iran and Israel, uh, I. Uh, Many people talk about the conflicts in the Middle East as Shia, Sunni, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I do not agree with this line of analysis. I strongly believe the main conflict in the Middle East is between Iran and Israel. Uh, these are the two major powers in the Middle East, and they are already in low intense war, low intense conflict in Syria, in Iraq, in other places. It is not Iran and Saudi Arabia, it is Iran and uh, uh, Israel. Uh, the other point about Iran and Israel, to the best of my knowledge, the two countries do not want to go to uh, 
all out war. Uh, the two countries, the leaders on both sides understand that all out war will be too dangerous for both of them and for the entire region. They, so far, they prefer to compete, to fight each other in this gray zone. Okay. For Iran, uh, the main reason why Iran is investing in cyber, uh, first, Iran does not have the financial means like most of its neighbors. The congressman mentioned uh, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, all these countries, Israel, all of them are very rich and they spend a lot of money on buying state-of-the-art weapons. Iran has been under sanctions since 1979. So uh, given this uh, lack of financial resources, Cyber makes perfect sense for the Iranian leaders. Also, uh, uh, the Iranians perceive the re revolution mainly as cultural revolution. It is not economic revolution. The revolution took place in 1979. At that time, Iran was a very rich country. Oil prices were very high. The Iranians are very concerned about soft power, about culture, and this why cyber domain is very important. For the Iranian leaders, they perceive that the West, United States, are trying to uh, brainwash uh, the minds of their young people. And this why they mean culture is extremely important for Iran. It is not by chance that they want to Oscar uh, prizes uh, more than any other Middle Eastern country. Uh, the Iranians also uh, are trying to diversify their economy away from oil. All producing countries are doing the same, but uh, for Iran uh, with sanctions, they, they understand they have no choice. Uh, they have to reduce their dependency on, on oil this means creating modern economy. This means uh, digital economy uh, opening the country. And finally, uh, the Iranians are driven by pride. They want to make their country uh, a scientific hub in the region and around the world. And to make their country a scientific hub, cyber, to, to uh, show advances in technology and in science. This is why they are very motivated to invest in cyber. Turning point in Iranian efforts in cyber domain was uh, the stocks net or operation Olympic games, which was discovered 2010. Uh, United, this is operation claimed that United States and Israel uh, put virus in Iran's nuclear facilities, and it took the Iranians about two years to figure out what was going on and to stop it. I said claims because officially United States and Israel have never uh, taken responsibility for this. Uh, in the media, in academia, uh, people uh, talk about this, but again, uh, officially, United States and Israel have never taken responsibility for this, but uh, this was major uh, cyber operation. The first time computer was used to inflict physical damage. And uh, this, uh, drove the Iranians to invest in cyber. Since that time, the Iranians created many institutions. There is uh, the Supreme Council of Cyberspace, led by the Iranian president and major uh, ministers and head of intelligence, uh, representative of the Supreme uh, Leader. Uh, I will, I will not talk about any cyber attacks by Iran because the uh, Department of Justice has already uh, invited some Iranians, but probably uh, there is more information 
has not been made public than what we know. Israel uh, is believed to be the strongest country when it comes to cyber in the Middle East and one of the strongest in the world. And there are good reasons for this. Uh, the, when Israel was created in 1948, Israel was outnumbered by the Arabs. So Israeli leaders decided the way to uh, balance uh, this disadvantage they had was to invest in technology. The way to defeat their enemies was to advance in technology. Uh, another reason why Israel is superpower in cyber because uh, Israel has very limited natural resources. As you know, uh, Israel just discovered natural gas, but traditionally Israel is not rich in natural resources. Uh, finally, uh, Jewish immigrants to Israel are different from immigrants to any other country. Usually the immigrants to Israel are the best educated in their home countries. They go to Israel, they bring with them this education, this, these skills, so it helps Israel. Uh, in Israel, uh, they advance in cyber based on cooperation between the government, the private sector, and academia. There are major Israeli universities uh, investing in uh, cyber. And uh, the military in Israel depends very much on technology. Because we are running out of time, I will briefly uh, mention four points about the way forward. First, it is very hard to uh, give any accurate assessment of cyber power. Uh, countries do not uh, talk about their cyber weapons. Uh, countries do not display the, their cyber weapons. So it is extremely hard to provide accurate assessment of cyber power. Uh, second, uh, the cyber confrontation, the digital confrontation is already going on and it is likely to be even more tense in the coming months and years. Thirdly, it will not be confined only to Iran and Israel. Uh, Abraham Accord, Israel has close ties now with UAE, with Bahrain, with other countries. This uh, cyber confrontation between Iran and Israel is extending all over the Middle East. And this leads me to the last point. Uh, all of us here trying to make peace in the Middle East and around the world, it is very important to try to reduce tension between Israel and Iran, and uh, not only in the cyber domain, but in the real world. As I mentioned in the beginning, the two countries do not want to go to all war between them, but uh, War cannot be ruled out. Uh, confrontation in cyber domain can lead to uh, physical war between Israel and Iran, and this will be bad to everybody. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. Um, for those of you who joined us a few minutes late, I want to remind you that my name is Basima al Hussein, and I am the Executive Director of the Middle East Policy Council. For the first part of our Q&A, I have some pre-prepared questions, and I'd also like to incorporate questions from the audience. So you can submit those either directly to me in the chat chat box, or if you prefer, and also to those of you who are watching on our YouTube live feed, please email your questions to info at mepc.org. Again, that's info at mepc.org. So the first question is a broad question that any of the panelists can answer, and I'd like to um, also remind the panelists that you are more than welcome to engage amongst yourselves. So if you agree or disagree, please feel free to chime in whether or not a question is, direct, is directed specifically to you. According to a BBC article published in July, 2021, in response to the cyber attack on Saudi Aramco, 
Experts warn that oil that the oil and gas industry has failed to properly invest in cybersecurity to combat modern day cyber th threats. What are some immediate steps that both Middle Eastern and US governments can take to help energy businesses combat cyber threats? Well, that, that statement is true, Basima. Uh, uh, and uh, the oil companies know it's true. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the companies that, uh, uh, the countries that, uh, that house those oil companies uh, headquarters know it's very true. They need to invest more and uh, they, uh, they need to be more vigilant and they should not expect that uh, governments are necessarily going to provide them perfection. They need to make an investment themselves, do a much better job than they're currently doing. They, uh, the, the, too many vulnerabilities have been exposed. And of course, in fairness to the oil companies, it's not just the rigs that uh, are exposed, they have pipelines that go for uh, hundreds if not thousands of miles. And those pipelines, of course, are also vulnerable. So it's easier said than done uh, in terms of protecting uh, uh, the entire extraction and delivery of, uh, uh, of fuel, but uh, clearly more needs to be invested on the part of the oil companies. So Congressman Moran, as a follow-up to that and then to the other panelists, not just talking about the energy infrastructure within the United States, but what can both the US government do and Middle Eastern governments do to best facilitate public-private partnerships to combat these threats? Is there, for example, a standard of, um, of expectations on a certain threshold of infrastructure security each company should have? And if not, why not? How can we decide uh, what level is needed? And would it be overly burdensome to require companies, especially multinational companies to meet this in order to participate in e-commerce? Uh, if I may, uh, I can jump in here. I believe at least three things United States government uh, can do in cooperation with our allies in the Middle East. One and most important to develop human resources, invest in education, uh, cyber technology, all these things are very important. And uh, many, for their credit, many Middle Eastern countries are already investing in education in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in UAE, and other countries. There are universities from Europe, from, from the United States, but they need to do more. And uh, when uh, uh, United Nations published many reports on education in the Middle East, and so far the best universities in the Middle East are in Israel, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, Arab countries need to do more, to invest more, and part of this investment is transparency. Uh, it is very hard to advance education when there is no uh, freedom in the political system. They go hand in hand. So it is very important to invest in human resources. Uh, another point is uh, maybe track to uh, uh, try to uh, help countries to uh, come to the conclusion that cyber attacks is lose-lose situation. Uh, to try to build some confidence, similar to the work on nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. And uh, probably finally, uh, we, ha we have the uh, non-proliferation uh, non treaty to prevent nuclear weapons all over the world. And there are regional efforts to make the Middle East nuclear weapon free zone. I believe maybe similar efforts to help Middle Eastern countries, Iran, Israel, Arab countries, uh, to reach uh, some rules, regulations, not to attack each other in the cyber domain. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so we have a great audience question that is very broad and I think every panelist can speak to it. 
How can U.S.-led cyber defensive multilateralism be advanced in the region? What are some specific recommendations or, initi or initiatives the panels would suggest? The panelists would suggest. This question is from David Baker. I can uh, take a crack at this one. Thanks, David, for your question. Um, so in the past, the U.S. Uh, State Department specifically um, has created programs to foster cooperations, uh, cooperation between Israel and, and uh, Arab countries. Um, I think the Middle East Regional Cooperation Program was one example. Um, and there are very specific projects uh, that they were dedicated to uh, fostering collaboration between Arab and Israeli scientists and so on. Um, I, I think now that the Abraham Accords have taken place, um, it uh, it, things are a lot easier um, for Israel and, and uh, some of the uh, Gulf states to uh, cooperate on, on cyber defense, uh, independent of the United States. But one area where uh, the United States could uh, step in here uh, would be to facilitate um, potentially uh, a working group of sorts or um, some sort of multilateral uh, center to um, uh, share uh, threat intelligence and, and potentially even collaborate on, on incident response. Um, you know, I made the, the terrorism analogy before, uh, and one of the most important things there is to uh, connect the dots um, between different actors and, and organizations and their networks. So it's sort of similar uh, in cyberspace, um, whether you're dealing with uh, state actors, but also with uh, non-state actors and ransomware organizations uh, to uh, have intelligence and be able to connect the different actors and their payments and, and all the way up the chain uh, to disrupt their activities. So um, that, that could be one, one uh, potential area. Well, I'm all for multilateralism. Uh, it obviously, it only makes sense. But uh, if we do that, I do think it's imperative for the United States to insist upon some of its uh, most fundamental uh, principles be part of any multilateral agreement. In other words, you don't use uh, our technology or any of the multi shared technology uh, to suppress dissent. Uh, it, it to uh, imprisoned uh, uh, people who uh, are, are journalists uh, and um, advocates for uh, human rights and women's rights, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that those objectives should transcend the economic benefits. Uh, and um, uh, the, so that's number one. And number two, uh, I think we all know that there are far more ransomware attacks uh, that uh, take place that we don't hear about. And the reason is that uh, the corporate world doesn't like to reveal them. Uh, they know it's gonna hurt them in terms of their uh, equity value. Uh, it, it's going to scare shareholders uh, and it's possibly going to encourage other uh, ransom attacks. So what they do is they, they pay off uh, these perpetrators of ransomware uh, privately, uh, secretly, uh, and of course the perpetrators uh, figure, well, big oil companies, uh, the big American corporations, they have more than enough money, so this is not a problem. And, and in some cases, in some countries, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's not a crime at all. Uh, Russia is the most obvious case. Uh, uh, the people that conduct ransomware attacks in Russia uh, walk around the street and, and in some cases seem to be hailed by the, uh, the government as pursuing their, their national objectives. But uh, those are the two things. Uh, let's tie our fundamental principles with an expansion of uh, technology uh, multilaterally. And two, I think we need to uh, uh, insist that uh, in the case of many of these major ransomware attacks, uh, that they not pay it off, that they expose it, and that we work together uh, to go after the perpetrators instead of letting them uh, uh, pocket their money and, and walk away without 
uh, with full impunity. Uh, may I make two brief points? Yes. Uh, one, I believe cooperation between regional countries, between Israel and UAE, between Israel and Morocco is great and the United States uh, should help other countries, should encourage cooperation between regional powers. But one big problem with this approach, uh, most of the time or all the time, this cooperation is seen, is perceived as against third party, against another country. I believe maybe it's too idealistic, but in my mind, the four peoples in the Middle East, the Iranians, the Turks, the Israelis and the Arabs have always been in the Middle East and will always be. Somehow they find they have to find some way to live together. The Iranians are not going anywhere, the Israelis are not going anywhere, the Arabs and Turks. They have to learn how to live together. There are always differences between neighbors, but they will always be neighbors. My second point, as the congressman mentioned about uh, cyber crime ransom. Now, uh, cyber crime is becoming national security. The attack on colonial pipeline uh, was huge, uh, uh, huge inconvenience to American economy. It became national security, and this is why Biden administration decided to do something about it. The attack on oil companies. The same thing, uh, the Saudi economy, the Emirati economy depends on oil. At, this is cyber crime, but it is national security. Thank you. If I could just build on these two remarks, um, I would really echo uh, the Congressman's point on uh, really uh, putting forward uh, US and um, often allied uh, principles as well as part of collaboration um, and especially. Uh, uh, in offensive cyber capabilities. I put a link in the chat to a report where we detailed exactly the kinds of risks and human rights risks with selling and exporting offensive cyber capabilities, exactly as in the Project Raven and the Dark Matter cases that um, the Congressman mentioned, and how you can try and get around this. You know, there are ways that you can put conditions on post service, so people coming from intelligence agencies. There are also other kinds of levers you can pull, both regulatory and one diplomatically as well. But it's a complex space and you need to try and work across different foreign policy levers to try and have um, some kind of effect with allies as well. In terms of the oil and gas companies and critical infrastructure, this is this is a really a crucial point. And I just point to um, the evolution between uh, certain iterations of Iran attributed activity that we've seen so far in the Gulf states. So people have mentioned the Shamoon attacks in 2012. These are the famous ones. These are the wake up cool ones that really uh, put Aramco on the map and said cyber can be a uh, critical infrastructure disruption problem for the Gulf. But they came back later, right? So we have uh, four years after that, Shamoon 2 coming in, which again shows that there's a lack of capability there. And then a, year, a couple of years later, 2018, you have what's also been called Shamoon 3. Now, this was an attempted disruption, a wiper incident in Cypem, which is an Italian energy company, which is part of a supply chain for Ramco, right? So it's not directed at Ramco itself, but at other companies in this supply chain. And this gives you an idea of the complexity of the risk that is here, right? Even if you secure the national oil company itself, they have to work with different companies to be able to um, redo their business effectively. And so you can't secure all of them to the same extent. That's really difficult. And then we jump a year later. You know, and this is why we, it's good to get into specifics, as the congressman mentioned, right? The Dustman operation against the Bahraini petroleum company in 2019. Now here, the wiper did not have the same kind of effect. And, and that was largely because of joint investigation by threat intelligence companies and the national cybersecurity authorities in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain together. So they managed to sort of together really preempt what these Iran attributed actors were trying to do and limit the damage. So actually centralizing cybersecurity authority with good information sharing, as Simon suggested, in a civilian agency, a national cybersecurity authority in these Gulf states that has the power to really work with these companies and try and compel them to um, protect their systems can be effective. We see that in the development of the Iran wipers through the course of the moon over the last decade. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, James. And I think we're all much more aware to how sensitive the supply chain is uh, with what's going on currently. And that is such an important vulnerability for us to think about as policymakers and leaders. My next question is an audience question from Moon Sulfab in Senator McConnell's office. Uh, the question is geared towards Professor Shires. The question is, can cyber norms be introduced in the MENA region, given the reality that their offensive and defensive cyber capabilities uh, have such a big range? This is a really good question. So on the uh, international uh, cyber norms, how far they can be introduced. Now, I'll just point to two. Uh, then there's lots that have been developed, uh, debated at the uh, UN level, um, but I think two are really important. One is in terms of red line, right? Um, are there areas in which countries, even if they're adversaries, even if they're um, really not, um, in, even if they're engaging in conflict in other areas, can they agree to put certain parts of their infrastructure out of the bounds of cyber conflict, right? Now, this could be a diplomatic agreement. It could be a sort of piece of paper, but often these diplomatic agreements, especially in cyber, aren't necessarily worth the paper they're written, right? So what you really need to do is to in, uh, create these cyber norms through mutual agreement, what's often known in the academic literature as tacit bargaining. And we see this in, for example, the Israel-Iran uh, conflict. You see them testing the boundaries of what the other will accept, right? Uh, is it a um, intrusion into water infrastructure in Israel? Is it something, you know, these are not really attributed, so I'm not going to um, talk about the attribution here. Is it, for example, a uh, disruptive attack on railways in Iran or railway infrastructure, right? So these are where you could probably see certain actors testing the boundaries of what their targets find permissible, right? And this is also the creation of norms, but it's in a very different way to signing up to something on a piece of paper. So that's the red lines um, question, and that's a really important one. The other one is on escalation. And here's where I'll bring in the US to this picture, right? So we have seen the US explicitly say they've responded to Iranian provocation, Iranian uh, kinetic attacks with cyber responses using US cyber command uh, in these instances. Now, that's a really important step because it looks like the US did that in order to be de-escalatory, right? To show a forceful response, but not in a way that would escalate the situation further. And it's important to recognize that actually what you see in the US cyber strategy about the use of cyber operations to de-escalatory responses isn't necessarily what you see in Iran, right? So there are real differences in how both states view the best way to use the cyber capabilities they have, whether it's de-escalatory signaling or uh, wipers and uh, sort of disruptive activities in the region. And these differences are, uh, can be dangerous, especially if um, the sides expect something that then doesn't Excellent, excellent. Thank you, James. The next audience question is from former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar, Patrick Theros, an MEPC board member. He is building on some of the comments that Congressman Moran made in his opening remarks. So uh, Ambassador Theros's question is, given that other countries offense, giving other countries offensive cyber capabilities runs some risks. Many repress their populations and others may use them to attack countries who we want to protect. How can we best deal with this? All panelists feel free to answer. Uh, okay, I, I can say a few words and turn it to my other colleagues. Uh, when the Arab Spring started, there was a great deal of excitement because the Arab Spring meant that uh, governments cannot censor their population. Uh, everybody can read anything online. Uh, people were able to organize things online. But what happened since 2011, the state regained its control on, uh, in cyber domain. It is not as free as uh, people thought it was in 2011. 
and uh, now uh, states governments have more control in cyber domain than they should. I mean, the main idea about internet is that it is open, transparency. People, any place in the world can read New York Times, can uh, read any paper they want, any place in the world. Uh, this is not the case anymore, and governments figured out ways to control cyber domain. And uh, we, uh, we have to uh, focus on making the internet the way it is meant to be, to be transparent, open to everybody, to try to reduce state control. As, uh, as you all know, like China, Russia, uh, other countries are trying to build digital wall, trying to build national internet. And this is the opposite of what internet is meant to be. Thank you. I could come in here um, just to uh, echo Gara's comments um, on the seeing the development of the combination of national security and human rights, especially in the Middle East um, and in the Arab region, as in the larger picture of after the Arab Spring, right after the protest and this sort of reactivation of uh, state control of the information space in the region. Um, to add to these uh, risks, I think Patrick. Uh, identifies two. One is repressing populations. The other one is um, acting in uh, foreign countries. Now, I just sort of echo Congressman's uh, earlier remarks and they're saying they're not necessarily distinct. Right? What you sometimes see, especially in hack and leak operations, is the same kind of tools, the same kind of uh, technologies being used to uh, blackmail or hack and leak uh, individuals who are uh, speaking out against the government, speaking out um, against the regime, but they can also be used in terms of interfering in foreign policy, right? And this has happened not just in the region, but also in the US, right? You've seen hacking leak operations attributed to some of the Gulf states against uh, particular individuals in US politics. And so the kind of uh, risks that you see that are both maybe repression and uh, those of foreign interference, they can be, um, they're not necessarily distinct and you can see some of them in the same, uh, in the same operation. So it's, it's more difficult to picture than sometimes might appear to be the case. Yeah, I, I think that we need to, um, uh, to focus on our vulnerabilities at, uh, at home domestically. Uh, uh, if, if we want to uh, ensure that our technology is not being used for nefarious or at least purposes that are not consistent with our long-term uh, objectives. Um, uh, uh, Ambassador Theros uh, uh, kind of obliquely referred to what went into the blockade of Qatar, which was a, basically a cyber operation. But years earlier, uh, the United Arab Emirates paved the way. They uh, it appears in, in uh, court proceedings. They uh, actually, it's, it doesn't appear, it's more than that. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of George Nader was given three and a half million dollars to influence Hillary Clinton's campaign um, they, they, uh, by the United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, he has, uh, there's a 53 count indictment uh, against him. Of course, it took three years for that indictment to come down. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, the, these countries are not uh, going to choose one political party over another. That's irrelevant. Uh, what's relevant is whether they're, what party is going to be in power. And so they, uh, they when it, in 2016, when it looked like uh, uh, Donald Trump was going to be elected, they switched uh, immediately. And um, uh, he, he gets a uh, uh, guy by the name of Elliot Broidy. Uh, was given $9 million to operate. And then uh, there's a lawsuit currently going through the courts that, that it looks like he was given 200, given 200 million uh, for intelligence gathering uh, by, again, the UAE to conduct a disinformation campaign against uh, Qatar within the United States. And so that was kind of paving uh, the ground for uh, the subsequent attack, they, uh, they gave 600,000 to politicians. Uh, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is, is mentioned. 
So they knew what they were doing. Uh, and and uh, so then when they, they waged the cyber attack, uh, uh, they hacked the Amir of Qatar's emails and then deliberately misrepresent uh, what was said. Um, the, the, no one in the United States really objected to that other than Secretary of State Tillis and some people in the, in the military. That never should have been allowed to happen because the United States was unfortunately too much involved in that kind of uh, uh, what now looks like a, a, a nefarious action, but it was based upon um, a, a misinformation that was circulated within American society and particularly uh, within the government. So we need to um, shore up our vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, we need to be on the lookout for other countries trying to manipulate uh, public opinion and manipulate uh, federal legislators and people in the United States government, whether it be a Democratic or a Republican administration, because uh, these other countries are smart. If they're going to do something that it's important to them, but has an effect upon the United States, they're gonna pave the way first. So I, um, I think that's the first thing that, uh, that we need to do. And basically it, it involves being less naive. And uh, again, as, uh, as James has been saying, keep our principles, which we share with the Western world, uh, particularly well, the, with, the, with Europe and, and the uh, uh, Scandinavian countries. They're, these these are Western principles of the Enlightenment. They're not new, uh, but they're something that uh, we should uh, uh, be defined by. And yet, in a lot of these transactions, it, seem, it, 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 it seems as though we're putting uh, economic growth ahead of uh, the advancement of uh, the principles that are, are most important to us. And that's going to come back to haunt us. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so our next audience question is from Nora Dean El Gawi. And the question is, um, within the sixth and seventh chapter of the United Nations Charter, uh, we have the mechanism to create international treaties to respond to uh, threats to peace and security. Are there any specific laws or treaties that are currently being debated in the UN or that should be considered at the UN level or any other international institution to help uh, address the issue of cyber threats? Yes, definitely. And maybe I'll start with this and then hand over to my fellow panelists. So we can think about this in three areas. The first is treaties to constrain state behavior at the level of conflict or armed conflict and war, right? And this has been discussed at the UN for going on 20 years. Um, there has not been agreement, um, and there has not been agreement, especially on any uh, binding sort of new treaties. What there has been agreement on is these norms of responsible state behavior that I talked about, and also on the general principle that international law applies to cyberspace. Right, so it's not a completely new area where the rules still have to be defined. International law and especially the law of armed conflict can be applied, can be extended to cyber operations. That's a really important principle and it wasn't taken for granted. It took a lot of UN negotiations to get there. The second of, uh, kind of treaties are cyber crime ones. So there's been uh, international uh, conventions on cyber crime, most notably the Budapest Convention, again for maybe 15 years or so, and there are new negotiations going on now with cybercrime treaties. The danger for these treaties is the expansive definition of cybercrime. Not everyone agrees on who should be a cyber criminal or who should be a cyber terrorist, as Simon and Congressman Moran identified. So there's a real split here between a sort of Russia-China view of uh, cybercrime treaties and a Western view, a US and European allies view of cybercrime treaties. The last way in which international treaties go through is through export control. And there are already export control mechanisms on offensive cyber capabilities through something called the Vassenaar arrangement. But so far, as you can see from the uh, evidence that we've seen from the cases that we've discussed, they're not necessarily working as well as they could be. Thank you. Does anybody have yeah. anything you'd like to add to that or should I go to a next question? Simon, go ahead. The, the only thing I have to add is, is that there have been uh, agreements uh, agreed upon by consensus uh, in, at the UN regarding cyber norms, uh, as James talked about. Um, but, but the problem is, is that there's just this disagreement fundamentally uh, 
among states on on really what these norms mean and and what type of behavior uh, would constitute a, a violation. Uh, so without that kind of uh, even understanding, it's it's very difficult to to uh, see a path forward uh, right now. Uh, if, if I may add one point here and also ask the congressman question, the, the challenge is it is not only to stay with our values and uh, work with our allies, but the challenge is uh, the cyber domain is open to everybody, all countries in the world, and some countries do not play by the, by the rules. I mean, as hard as United States tries to work with European allies, uh, Russia, China, and other countries, uh, even Israel, uh, they challenge the rules of the game. I mean, uh, Israel, <clears throat> one main attraction for Abraham Accord is Israel uh, as major cyber power, uh, looks very attractive for UAE, for Bahrain to partner with Israel and to import Israeli cyber technology. And this technology is used to uh, spy on other countries, uh, on other individuals. So it is in my mind that probably if the congressman would like to add something, it is not only United States trying to work with allies who share our values, but there are adversaries who have different vision, different uh, perception of the international system, and they uh, do not work with us and uh, make it more complicated for us. Thank you. Well, uh, good, uh, these are the kinds of questions that invariably got me in trouble when I was in the United States Congress trying to answer them honestly. Uh, the United States, uh, excuse me, Israel, <clears throat> in some cases they're almost interchangeable uh, in terms of foreign policy, it, but Israel has the most sophisticated and also the most lethal uh, cyber cap capability really in the world. Uh, if, if you want to, uh, and I know the UAE uh, particularly is very much aware of this, uh, if, if you really want to play hardball in terms of uh, offensive cyber capabilities, you contract with an Israeli firm. Uh, some of that information has been gotten from uh, the, the United States, uh, but a lot of it was uh, developed uh, uh, within uh, within Israel. So, uh, you know, con congratulations, Israel, on, on a very important uh, issue. You really have surpassed the rest of the world. Um, so that should be a good thing. The problem is that uh, any of us that follow what is happening in the cyber world see time and again that this capability is being sold and being used uh, for a purpose that, is, that are not in any way consistent with our fund most fundamental values. Um, and um, and I, I take objection to the attitude of the Israeli government, which, which is, while they work in the development of this firm, if this firm contracts with another country, then, oh, well, that's a private firm. We don't bear responsibility. And it seems to me they, they ought to assume some responsibility for some of the technology uh, that um, has been developed and that now is proliferating uh, throughout the world. And much of it is being used for uh, nefarious reasons counted to, as I say, our principles. It's a big problem. Uh, and um, and I think it's only going to get worse. Uh, I, I'm in favor of the Abrahamic Accords. Uh, I, I want there to be peace in the Middle East region. I want more cooperation between uh, Israel and, uh, and Arab countries, between the Shia and the Sunni countries. Uh, but I don't want it being used to suppress dissent, to uh, uh, continue to um, uh, uh, control what people are able to see, read, and uh, and learn, uh, and uh, and yet a lot of cyber capability is using being used for that purpose, particularly in Arab countries, but and in uh, uh, in, in Egypt. So um, 
uh, it uh, it troubles me, and and I would think that the you, that the alliance between Israel and the United States should be one that is based upon the advance of those principles. Uh, it, Israel is the most democratic nation uh, in in the Middle East, uh, and it's the freest in terms of dissent of the availability of uh, uh, the free flow of information, etc. But for their technology to be used uh, against those overall objectives uh, is troubling. And I think the U.S. and Israel need to need to address that. And I think that's an area um, where the United States uh, and potentially uh, NATO and some European partners can step in and, and potentially block doing business with some of these companies that have demonstrated um, you know that that their products are are being misused by by their customers. Um, uh, potentially leave them out of of contracts uh, going forward, and and kind of set a precedent for uh, Israel, and and hopefully push them to uh, better manage that situation. But uh, I have to uh, uh, refer everyone to uh, uh, a report that James uh, co-authored, actually for the Atlantic Council on the proliferation of offensive cyber capabilities that's uh, in the chat, uh, if, if everyone can see that. We're also happy to send it around to the participants afterwards. So thank you very much for um, sharing that. The next question is, um, is geared towards Simon, but please everybody feel free to chime in. So we've spoken a lot today about the tension between Iran and Israel. Gaudat, in fact, said he believes that's the main proxy war um, in the Middle East, or rather the main tension in the Middle East. So how do Iranian and Israeli cyber proxies complicate cyber policies in the Middle East? Can pro proxy groups be held to the same standards and repercussions as state actors themselves? If not, what are our options for mitigating conflicts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have seen uh, Iranian proxies uh, complicating the situation, uh, no doubt about it. Um, I mean, looking at uh, Hezbollah uh, has been engaged in in um, in attacks, um, uh, notably cyber espionage campaigns, not just against Israel, but also Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE, even the U.S. and and some uh, European uh, countries, um, and and. Hamas is is pretty much the same way uh, engaged uh, against the uh, Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority through cyber espionage campaigns. They're um, uh, engaged in in phishing attacks and uh, trying to download spyware uh, on uh, uh, against IDF soldiers and and uh, we've seen examples of that going back almost ten years now, um, as far as I'm tracking. Um, so. Uh, this presents a real problem. I mean, this is this these types of uh, espionage operations um, uh, give them leverage. Um, if they can get information on uh, you know sensitive topics, whether it's negotiations uh, and, and share it with the Iranians, or, or if they could get uh, just more operational level stuff uh, to lure soldiers and into compromising situations. Um, as has happened uh, in the case of Hamas, um, that's a, a very big threat to Israel. Um, how can we uh, mitigate this? Um, I think one way is, 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 again, trying to prevent these, these actors from obtaining uh, some of these advanced capabilities uh, and tools from outside the region. Um, the United States and like-minded uh, states can crack down on, on some of the countries that are providing safe havens to uh, some criminal groups uh, uh, that are uh, providing direct support or know-how and technical uh, and operational support to uh, groups in the region. Um, and of course, uh, responses uh, as demonstrated by Israel and the US don't necessarily have to be limited to cyberspace. Um, 
and and both countries have taken kinetic action against uh, some of these non-state uh, actors, um, specifically Hamas and ISIS um, in the region uh, that have been, uh, I guess, engaged in life-threatening types of cyber activities. May, may I add a few points here? Uh, one reason the, the complication supporting uh, different groups in cyber domain, the international law, uh, the main unit in the international law is the state. International law is created to regulate relations between nation states. Uh, and this is what I mean, the main unit in international law is the state. In cyber domain, it is not the state. Uh, in cyber domain, it is private companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and individuals. I mean, it is amazing that uh, Twitter prevented the president of United States, the president of the strongest country in the world from uh, Twitter. This shows that cyber domain is very different from international law. It is not the state in cyber domain. And uh, my, my approach to, to, to prevent uh, militia or uh, attacks by individuals or by private groups supported by state in the Middle East, the, the way is cyber domain is not separated from the big picture. Uh, the attacks, mutual attacks between Iran and Israel and other countries, the way to reduce it, to regulate it, is to uh, invest in uh, confidence measures, is to reduce tension. And one issue related to cyber uh, is the Palestinian issue. There will always be tension in the Middle East as long as uh, there is no solution to the Palestinian issue. Uh, there will be tension as long as the major issues of conflict between Israel, Iran, Turkey, and Arab countries have not addressed. Uh, solving the Palestinian issue will not uh, end uh, cyber attacks, but will reduce incentives for cyber attacks. And the same thing about other issues. Thank you. If I could just add a uh, footnote to this important question of um, proxies and responsibility, um, there's a slight difference between the question of uh, proxy groups who are proxies in all domains, so this is something like Hamas or Hezbollah, and the question of more specific cyber proxies, right? A lot of the issues around cyber operations are actually tracing them back to state actors in the first place, showing that there's a particular state whether it's Iran or someone else, is behind a cyber operation. In a lot of the indictments, for example, mentioned by Gaudat earlier against, um, by the US Department of Justice against UN cyber actors, they are working for research institutes, for private companies, or even for universities as well. So there's a difficulty in attributing and tracing these cyber operations back to state actors in the first place, which makes it more difficult to use traditional uh, levers of power to corral them as well. And that's something that most cyber actors, including Iran, are very aware of and are able to use their Thank you. Um, building off of this previous discussion, um, Gaudet, you authored an article called Iranian-Israeli Confrontation in the Cyber Domain, published in 2020, in which you discuss the continued advancement of Iran and Israel's cyber, cyber capabilities and their political rivalry. In your opinion, how would cyber conflict or how has cyber conflict between these two countries already affected the overall stability of the Middle East and how may it or how has it already affected U.S. interests within the Middle East? Thank you. Uh, excellent question and thank you for mentioning my article. And uh, United States, and I'm glad I have this opportunity since I work for the Department of Defense, uh, United States has a long list of interests in the Middle East, and there is perception 
in my opinion, wrong perception that the United States is leaving, disengaging from the Middle East. U.S. has very extensive interests in the Middle East. It is not only about oil, but about uh, counterterrorism, about non-proliferation, about security of Israel, about peace and democracy in the Middle East. And uh, cyber attacks and counter attacks increase instability in the Middle East, which is bad for the United States. Uh, United States does not want only to sell arms and make money, but in the long term, peace in the Middle East, peace around the world is good for the United States. And uh, this is why uh, these attacks and counterattacks, not only by Iran and Israel, but also by other powers, uh, increases, uh, these attacks increase instability in the Middle East. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Arabs, the Turks, the Israelis, and the Iranians will always be part of the Middle East. In the long term, it is better for the United States to uh, not to be too interested in making money, selling arms, but to get these four peoples to accept each other and accept the legitimate security concerns for each other. Uh, many of us talked about Iran. Uh, as a scholar, I try to put myself in the Iranian leaders' shoes. When they look around them and see Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, have state-of-the-art weapons and have almost unlimited financial resources. Uh, the Iranian national interests are different from those of Israel from Saudi Arabia, and the Iranians with very limited financial resources see investment in cyber as the way to achieve some kind of balance of power in the region. And uh, the Iranian revolution is only 42 years old. Iran has 5,000 years of civilization. 42 years are very short in uh, Iranian calendar. It is very important to address the major issues in cyber domain in nuclear weapons. Uh, the Arabs and the Turks and the, the Iranians are raising the issue that Israel is the only nuclear power in the Middle East. We have to uh, find way for all these people's governments to uh, talk to each other, accept each other. This is good for the United States and good for the region. Thank you. I, I can address that a little bit if uh, you'd like, uh, 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 and I, I, uh, I've agreed with everything you said today for whatever it's worth. Uh, I disagree to some extent with, your, uh, uh, with the thesis that you just uh, uh, enunciated. The United States is going to diminish its military footprint in the Middle East. Uh, there are many people who feel that uh, it is somewhat uh, of a provocation uh, for conflict to, to have uh, as large a military presence as it has. Uh, it's not going to move CENTCOM off of uh, al Air Base, but I, but I think there will be more concentration of uh, U.S. military resources um, and a, 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 an overall reduction uh, with a shift to, uh, to Asia. Uh, the U.S. believes that um, there is no real threat to U.S. shores that is going to come from the Middle East. Uh, there is some threat uh, from uh, uh, China and Russia and that um, the U.S. can play a, a role in preventing the hegemonic control of um, uh, China over the uh, a vast Asian region, it, that would not be in US interest. So I think you are gonna see a gradual shift. And I, I don't think it's a partisan issue. I, I think that that thinking is, is, is pretty much shared on both sides of the political aisle in the United States, uh, that uh, we have, spent, we have uh, uh, lost too much uh, uh, blood and uh, uh, not to mention uh, money 
uh, invested in conflicts in the Middle East and where, what has it gotten us? Not much, uh, nothing actually. And, and it's been kind of a setback to, uh, uh, to world peace. So um, uh, I, I've spoken with a number of my friends and colleagues in the House and Senate and uh, uh, there's, there's uh, pretty much of an, a, a uh, uh, near consensus that uh, not only are we going to ex not expand our military footprint, we're going to uh, reduce it. That doesn't mean that we won't be involved in things like cyber, of course, in the Middle East. But in terms of, of hard military presence, I, I think you're going to see a, 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 a diminishment of that. I'll just add on to that, uh, Congressman, that uh, we have been seeing this uptick in um, attacks on critical infrastructure, including uh, maritime facilities uh, in the region, in Iran and in Israel. And I think that's an area where the United States definitely has an interest, um, to your earlier point, um, in protecting, uh, ensuring, you know, the, the uh, flow of energy uh, and uh, uh, international shipping lanes. Um, because uh, not only is Iran targeting them, but it's their... Uh, being targeted by uh, Russia and China as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. That's clear. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question is geared towards Simon. In September, you published an article called The Future of Cyber Diplomacy, which discusses the lack of normalized international expectations regarding state cyber behavior. behavior. In your opinion, what should these norms be? Which targets should be prohibited and which should be considered norm violations? And how can the U.S. best assist in establishing and expediting these standards? That's a, <laughs> that's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I mean, uh, in, in June, you saw President Biden uh, kind of uh, famously lay out the uh, 16 critical infrastructure sectors to uh, Vladimir Putin uh, during the summit that were off limits uh, to attack. I think that is, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit broad because, um, you know, some of those uh, sectors include areas like uh, the, you know, uh, the defense sector, uh, which have never been off limits uh, really to, to attack. So, so uh, being that broad um, doesn't do much good in my opinion, but it is uh, certainly important. James was talking about um, uh, it earlier to kind of identify areas that are off limits that, that we won't go after and, and, and that uh, countries like Russia uh, shouldn't go after, but uh, leading by example is, is really important here. Um, and I, I forget if there was a second part of the question. <laughs> Sorry, it was just what can the U.S. do to help facilitate these norms? Yeah, again, uh, uh, leading, leading by example, um, I think we touched on it earlier, but, um, you know, norms uh, include um, who we uh are, are selling, um, you know, uh, some of our capabilities to, uh, as discussed earlier, um, we can certainly uh, limit uh, uh, the countries and, and companies who are um, misusing, um, abusing these, these capabilities, using them against their own citizens and, and, uh, and you know, human rights activists. Um, but, yeah. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, if I may, two, two points. One, one character of uh, cyber domain, it is much easier to attack than to defend. And this, why as hard as we try, it is easier to attack. It, it, in my mind, it's like uh, in terrorism, uh, good guys, governments have to be right all the time, 100%. Bad guys have to be right only one time. The same thing in cyber. Uh, uh, it is much easier to attack than to def defend. The other point I want to, to make, till today, to the best of my knowledge, 
countries have not come to agreement on how to prevent, how the, to convince the bad guys that they will pay a high price if they attack. Veterans, there is no way to convince them. We are entertaining different options. One of them is to respond to a terrorist attack with military action to impose economic sanctions. But so far, the, ru the rules are not clear how to respond to a terrorist, uh, to cyber attack. And this makes things more complicated. Thank you. Uh, that is, uh, oh, go ahead, Basma. I, I was just going to say Gadad is, is absolutely right on that. Uh, I totally agree. But uh, go to your next question, if you want. Okay, so our next kind of series of questions has to do with Russia and, U and threats to the U.S. So um, to what extent does Russia collaborate with other countries on MENA efforts. Um, we do know that Russia, Russia associates with Syria's Assad re regime. Um, how does this further each country's cyber agenda and what does this mean for the US and our allies? This is a, <laughs> this is a I, I'm happy if somebody else wants to take this on, but I, I will if no one, uh, speaks up. I, um, and, and, and this uh, involves uh, a, a much wider uh, a question. Um, the, uh, we know that Russia either directly or through uh, contractors like the Wagner Group are, is embedding itself, uh, most notably in Syria, but in other places. Uh, they're involved in Libya. We, we have some major issues with the sale of F-35s to the Emirates because uh, it, it's, public, it's, it's um, the public information that uh, the, the, the members of the Wagner Group have been, uh, have been seen uh, apparently embedded uh, within uh, the military in, in the Emirates. Uh, so, but I have a, 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 a larger issue. I, I think that some of these, uh, particularly the Arab countries, uh, have the same kind of uh, they've, uh, the, the disease that we in the United States have. They think that this, that heavy weaponry, uh, big planes uh, and lethal equipment uh, is, um, is going to provide the kind of security that they're looking for. Uh, number one, it's being used to uh, continue conflict. Uh, the, the, the Saudis vis-a-vis uh, -vis Yemen is a case in point, uh, the Emirates as, as well. That war needs to be ended. And a lot of it is being conducted with American equipment, but we have the same problem. In the United States, we spend three quarters of a trillion dollars basically on medical equipment and on the maintenance of that equipment, training people how to use it, et cetera. It's more than, than at least uh, publicly all, every other nation uh, combined, certainly the top 15 spend on their military. I'm not sure that it's making us a lot more secure. And I'm gonna give a, uh, uh, tell a little story. On, on September 11th, 2001 in the morning, the Defense Appropriations Committee was meeting in the Capitol. And uh, we were in an intense debate uh, whether or not to spend $10 billion, this was a plus of $10 billion on the Missile Defense Agency or put it into cybersecurity as Richard Clark has ur had urged us to do. He had told us the United States is going to be attacked and you're putting all this equipment into hardware when you need to put more focus onto cybersecurity, invest a little more money. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, of course, contractors um, for one are gonna make more money at that time with hard equipment. But beyond that, uh, ships and planes and tanks and guns, they're, they have a visceral attraction. Uh, they're, um, you know, they're real, they're shiny, you can see them. And at least at the time, and I think it's pretty much the case still, the cybersecurity is kind of amorphous. 
we can't really get excited about investing in it. What do we have? It's, it's, uh, it, 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 we can't see it, we can't feel it. We, we, uh, it, it doesn't give us a sense of, of uh, physical security like, uh, uh, like uh, armaments do. And so we lost the vote. Um, there was a, a man by the vice chair of the committee, Norm Dix was his name from Washington. And we kept pushing Norm, focus, will you Norm, we need you in this debate. Uh, but he was watching television. And um, he says, look guys, look what just happened. A plane hit the World Trade Center. And as we were watching a second plane hit uh, the, the, the other tower. Uh, and so we had to evacuate. Uh, we eventually revisited that issue. And uh, after things had quieted down a bit, we could meet again in the Capitol. And, and yet the vote stood because nobody could really get their hands of, uh, uh, around what it meant to invest adequately in cybersecurity. We're still not investing adequately in cybersecurity. And we don't want to invest as much in offensive cyber capability as we do in defensive cyber capability. We're the wealthiest economy in the world. We need to protect our assets uh, as, uh, as has been suggested, but we're way behind. Now the countries in the Middle East, while they're catching up and Israel certainly has, uh, has, has been the most uh, aggressive, uh, they are still, when they talk to us about what they want to buy, it's still these big weapons, these weapons of war, when there is a cyber war that's going on right now. And that's what we need to be focusing on to a much greater extent. When we talk about diminishing our military presence in the Middle East, um, it, it's, that, it's that hard presence, that threatening presence that we need to diminish, not the use of technology for, for peaceful purposes and to advance uh, our most fundamental principles and interests. So I, I know I got carried away, but uh, that's kind of what comes to mind when that question is asked. Great, thank you. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left and I wanted to end with an audience question. Um, Nora Dean Elgawi is joining us all the way from Tripoli at the Department for Strategic, for Strategic and Regional Studies within the Li Libyan Academy for Graduate Studies. And the question is, is it possible to kind of explain the use of cyber attacks as a catalyst for competition versus one as being used as a tool of a cold conflict? Can any of the maybe professors speak to that question? Sure, I, I so you, oh. Gara, you go for it. Okay, thank you. First, just very briefly about Russia. I believe the main challenge for the United States is not Russia, it is China. There is digital cold war between the United States and China and uh, many countries are using China's uh, technology in building IT infrastructure. There is huge competition between the United States and China in 5G. And uh, as I said, China using its cash, its money to uh, build fiber cables and build IT infrastructure in countries even in Israel and many US officials expressed huge disappointment uh, Israel working with China in the IT sector. But uh, for cyber, I believe cyber is the tension, cyber, cyber war is symptom. It is expression of the uh, deep rooted conflicts in the Middle East. And the way to contain, to reduce tension in cyber domain is to address all the other issues. As I mentioned, the Palestinian issue, the nuclear issue, under development, transparency, when I mean, there is no magical solution and it will take long time, but when we address all these issues, when people feel they can express their opinions without fear, when uh, there is less gender inequality, when there is no religious discrimination, there will be less tension in the cyber domain. Thank you.
James, do you want to answer a little bit of Nora Dean's question? I, I, I'm aware we're out of time, so I'm very happy to leave uh, that as being the culminating thing. I, I um, stand behind it fully. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for participating today. I think this was an excellent panel, and one of the benefits of uh, going online is that we've been able to have speakers and audience members from all over the world. So thank you all for joining us and please be sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn just by simply searching Middle East Policy Council and on Twitter uh, by following Middle East Policy. And for those of you who have not yet submitted an article or an essay to our amazing editor and Joyce of the, of the Middle East Policy Journal. I hope you will consider doing so in the future. We'd love to publish you in our 